So thank you very much. Um, please just uh, let me introduce um, Professor Silvia Benedito, who will moderate the final panel. Um, Silvia is an assistant professor of landscape architecture here at the GSD, teaches graduate and core design studios in landscape architecture and urbanism, as well as advanced research seminars. She also serves as co-chair of the sensory media platform at the GSD. Sylvia's research and practice are focused on the role of atmosphere, it's a fascinating topic, and the meteorological envelope and space for sensory acquisition in the built environment. So thank you, Sylvia, for agreeing to, to moderate the, the final panel on new nocturnal landscapes. Thank you so much. I promise I will be brief. It has been a long day, a very exciting day as well. Well, first of all, I have to commend um, Gareth and William for this wonderful topic, because I think it's very timely um, for various reasons. One, um, and as, as I'm hosting um, this panel, panel on new nocturnal landscapes, um, one, I think we should look more critically um, to the role of electricity. You know, we all design, either we design for daylight or we all, when we think about landscapes or when, when we take photographs of landscapes or even when we talk about landscapes, there's always a presence of light. But also, there's also presence of electricity. You know, what does it mean to take, to be critical more to the presence of electricity? Uh, the second relevant point uh, is also that brings um, other geographies uh, into the discussion of our school, and, and that's really good and, and open up to other publics as well. Um, the concept of darkness, and maybe that's what I'm interested um, in, um, and I would like to see this more into the foreground for the last panel, um, actually came to my attention um, somehow recently as an intellectual and, and critical topic um, with a preacher, uh, Barbara Brown Taylor. Uh, she had a wonderful piece in the Time magazine in 2004 um, called uh, In the Praise of Darkness. Um, and here uh, she was praising the act of walking um, in the dark uh, as a moment to achieve enlightenment. Uh, she, al she actually talks about the concept of endarkment um, as an aesthetic, as a philosophical, and as a, as a spiritual uh, dimension um, as means to, to have a deeper touch of ourselves. Um, and that's because of the heightened sensory um, awareness beyond the retinal um, field. Um, and if light, uh, or if we take light uh, as associated with spirituality or religious beliefs, um, it's important to notice that uh, most of the religions um, have something to say uh, about fi finding God uh, and spirituality in the darkness. Buddha, for instance, um, meditated in the caves of northern India. Uh, Muhammad received the Quran um, in the cave outside Mecca. Saint Francis um, prayed in a tiny grotto near Assisi, and Jesus dived into the darkness um, before uh, resurrection. Um, I recommend to this audience uh, who are interested in these topics to look into um, the book um, of Barbara Brown Taylor, the preacher that I was mentioning, um, Learning to Walk in the Dark. The second um, moment of kind of deep deeper intellectual engagement with this topic is when I read uh, the book uh, titled Nocturne, A Journey in Search of Moonlight, um, uh, where there's a foregrounding of the light of the moon um, and the, the, the relation to the cycles of the moon as, as means to imagine that as a medium uh, in design. Um, this is a book by James uh, Attil, and it was suggested to me by a wonderful filmmaker, um, Peter Hutton, that unfortunately left this world uh, two years ago. Peter Hutton is um, a filmmaker, or was a filmmaker, unfortunately, um, um, an avant-garde filmmaker that used dimness um, as, as this kind of condition of filming. And he resisted to the digital um, formats because film was was is a skin, a very sensitive skin that registers wide parameters uh, of dimness, um, and that was a very beautiful way of, of talking about film at this skin that registers sensitive to light or its almost um, absence of light. 
Um, so what I would like really to, um, to think about or, or invite you to think about um, is through this, this uh, colloquium, symposium, is one is through this colloquium we are putting to the, to the four other uh, geographies and social practices, we are kind of framing this discussion um, on Middle East uh, territories and its design culture as uh, related to the after sun, when the sunset goes down. Um, and it's, it's a real, uh, great opportunity also to put in the discussion other latitudes beyond the 40 degree north latitude as we are so comfortable to talk about. Um, also, um, this is also an opportunity to think about what does it mean to design for darkness? What is that? Um, why do we continuously design thinking that is always daytime? Um, what if we design also for the night? Um, with that, um, I would like to uh, just to introduce very briefly our three speakers. Um, the first one is going to look into the list here. Stephen Vellegrini is from Perkin and Will. Um, Stephen is a landscape architect and direct, director of urban design at Perkins and Will in Dubai, amongst other uh, many uh, locations uh, in the world. And his talk um, is titled Dissociative Identities and Nocturnal Landscapes uh, in the Gulf. I'm looking forward to hear that. Um, the second speaker is Abdul Latif Almishari. Um, um, Abdul Latif is a principal architect uh, at the Associated Architects Partnership and a co-founder of the Arabana Project. Um, he's a member of the Supreme Council for Planning and Development uh, of Kuwait and a high committee of the planner, uh, Master Plan and Mega Projects at the Council of Ministers. And his talk uh, is titled Mundane Manahaz Desert Camps and Neon Lights. And our third uh, speaker, and there are two speakers, if I'm correct, <laughs> is Hamed Al-Ali Farid Esbael. Um, Hamed is an architect, uh, an entrepreneur from Dubai. Um, he graduated from the American University of Sharjah uh, and established at Ex Architects um, in 2003. Um, Farid studied architecture at the American University of Farjar School of Design uh, in 1997, uh, 2003. Um, he also uh, co-founded Ex Architects in 2003 in Dubai. And his, their talk um, is titled The Veils of Night. And I will introduce you further when you are called to, to the podium. Without further ado, please welcome Stephen. Thank you. Thank you very much again for uh, uh, inviting me here, Gareth and, and uh, William. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honour to be here. And thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, I'm uh, originally an urban planner. I originally studied urban planning uh, and found traditional urban planning lacking. And I, I ended up becoming a landscape architect. Um, I rather sort of surprisingly realised that I think other than Gareth, I may, may be the only other landscape architect that's speaking. Um, what, what I try to sort of look at when, we, we, when I was asked to speak about this, uh, this topic was really a, a landscape architectural approach um, and something that looks at the broader field uh, rather than sort of zooming in on a specific element of it. Um, this was really challenging. I'm, I'm used to, particularly in a commercial practice, having something very clear to speak about. And I have to give due credit to my wife, who's a, a cultural heritage uh, expert. Um, I, I, when I was invited, I asked her, what, what do you think I should speak about? And she rattled off a, a series of ideas. And as usual with most wives, she was a lot smarter than I was. And so a lot of what I'm speaking about today is due to her, her good guidance. But um, there is, in a sense, uh, a lot of tension that, that has been spoken about by a lot of the, lot of the people speaking today and yesterday. And, and I, I'm trying to wrap some thematic frame around all of those various different threads. Um, 
as with me, as I said, I'm a landscape architect and an urban planner, so the things that sort of started to resonate with me were the ideas of ecology. And I know that, um, you know, that's a problematic idea because we don't think about cities as ecologies. And uh, my personal predilection is towards thinking of cities as ecologies. Um, and when I think about ecology, in, particularly in the Gulf, you have to consider desert ecology. Uh, and why is it that cities, the cities that we're talking about, have become the way they've become? We, we have to consider context. Um, and I'll talk about that more later on. I think the urban planner side of me thinks about the aspirational elements of city building. And, and city building is really very much about aspiration. It's about, you know, in a sense, that build it and they will come attitude, particularly in the Gulf. Um, and in a way, um, again, sort of in an urban planning sense, um, we have to actually deal with the reality. I mean, there's sort of a history and an aspiration, but there's a reality. And what we, and Cristiano alluded to this before, that what we're dealing with is actually some cities that are dysfunctional, contiguous uh, cities. And we really have to consider those in their totality as a landscape uh, in order to sort of meaningfully deal with the, the problems that we have to deal with. So um, a lot of people have probably been a bit curious about this term disassociative identities. Um, not to put a negative spin on what I'm talking about, but what became apparent to me was that the, there is not one type of nocturnal landscape that we're talking about in the Gulf, but rather many types, uh, and in the sense of multiple personalities. Disassociative identities is, or disassociative identities disorder is what the, the current name is for multiple personality disorder. And I don't want to start this the wrong way by giving you a sense that there's a disorder, because I don't see it as a disorder. But I think we have to th realise that we're dealing with multiple overlapping personalities. Uh, and just like in, in, in many places uh, and many things, many organisms, that disassociative identity is the, is the presence of two or more uh, things. And we have to think about the multiplicity of things. There is a, a substrate underneath all of this multiplicity of things. And that, that, that interaction is what we're talking about and what we intervene in. Um, to try and give, uh, give you a practical example, I think this image, which is of Jumeirah Beach in, in Dubai, um, on first glance doesn't seem particularly remarkable. But really, it, it, it is personifying these disassociative identities. You have the, uh, you know, the blue-collar workers who are standing there in the periphery. You have a largely expatriate population on the beach. At the back of the beach, these houses are all Emirati uh, or national housing. So there's a tension. This space is contested in, in many ways, or if not contested, uh, occupied by multiple personalities. So um, to me, the cities of the Gulf reflect a, a kind of form of urban disassociation. The, the public realm has these multiple personalities, and they're often in conflict with one another. The conflict can be positive or negative. It doesn't have to necessarily always be negative. Um, and so I started questioning myself, what's contributed to this idea of, uh, or, or to the tension between these multiple personalities? Uh, and I sort of go through these in a series of categories because these are the sort of ways that it makes sense to me. Now, again, I, I acknowledge that the idea of ecology and the use of the term ecology is problematic. Uh, but to me, the, the ecology of the desert is relevant here because it relates to nocturnalism. So in the desert, we don't often think of it as an ecology, but it is a vibrant ecology, just like any other ecology. Uh, it, has, uh, it has all of the elements that any ecological setting has. Um, and in desert ecologies, specifically, organisms naturally favour the night because of, obviously, the thermal comfort reasons. So. In a way, I, I see that uh, and the organisms that, that sort of inhabit the natural desert environment or the, cult, the city urban desert environment um, being relevant. The ecology of that place is, in a sense, its origin. Um, and so I, I started looking at this idea of Gulf, Gulf urbanism as a kind of nocturnal socioecology. 
And what I mean by that is uh, the, the sort of overlapping characters, this sense of uh, different social groups and settings. Um, and, you know, in very basic and simple terms, ecology is the interaction of organisms and their environment. So anyone involved in the creation of physical places does have a role in ecology and we have to see ourselves that way. Because if not, we dismiss our own responsibility to preserving or creating uh, better ecologies. Um, and, and, you know, very simple terms, this image here is an ecology. It is organisms interacting with their environment. Um, and so while it may not be considered in the, sense, the traditional sense, it is a socio-ecology. Um, and I've talked about this tension, uh, and, and lots of people have talked about this sort of demography of the Gulf. Now, the percentages you see here on the screen are by no means definitive. The problem is there is no definitive idea of, and in this case I'm using the UAE, of the social makeup because the last real census was in 2005. And so a lot of these figures are drawn from uh, government, uh, governments of other countries saying this is how many nationals we have in this country. The, the, the striking thing, and it should be striking for anyone, is, is this, this number, 11% of the population, and I've heard it being anywhere between 11 and 19%, depending on where you're talking about, uh, is nationals. And a, a lot of the time, as a design professional, you, you sort of automatically are starting to think about the, the nationals of a place as your predominant uh, kind of market, in a way, but it's not. We have, in a sense, uh, you know, what's generalised as other Arabian and, and Iranian populations that even together with the nationals don't comprise a majority. Uh, Western expats are often identified as, you know, the, this enormous social group there. But as we've seen in many of the presentations, it's actually the South Asian and Southeast Asian populations that are the vast majority and the most underserved. Sorry, I'm just going to go back and uh, explain why I uh, use such a lewd image. What, the reason that I use this image is because, to me, it underscores the tension of most places in Dubai. This young lady is... They're probably both on holidays. To me, I, I would assume that the couple behind them are probably a Saudi couple. Uh, the lady in front is probably from a Western country there on a beach holiday. But this is the kind of tension that always happens. And it happens in an uh, obvious setting like this at the beach, but it happens in many places. And that poses the question, should we be concerned about this? Should we design to avoid it? Do we accept it and say that this is a global capital where there, will, there is 200 nationalities? So it's going to happen, we just have to deal with it. So... Um, a, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Dr Julian Bolliter, who's at the University of Western Australia, conducted a PhD thesis a few years ago. Uh, and he, looking for a place to start with his thesis, looked at international organisations like uh, IFLA and uh, the American Society of Landscape Architects and looked at their manifestos and said, well, what guidance does that give us as designers about what we should be doing in this scenario where we have... Uh, competing interests in a way. And very simply, any international standard for architecture, urban design or landscape architecture, compels us as professionals to design for everyone, to design for inclusivity. Now, Maha's talk earlier today highlighted how that can actually lead to a unique set of problems in its own right. But I, I, for the purposes of this, I'll, I'll continue on this, this idea that as professionals we should be doing uh, our best to include everyone. One of the things that, uh, that also was raised in Julian's uh, research and in research I've done since then and in several of the, the presentations today is the way that public spaces, and in this case in Dubai, uh, are implicitly controlled or explicitly. Uh, Safa Park is, or was until very recently, the large, one of the largest parks in Dubai. Uh, this is... Sorry... Uh, this is uh, Zabil Park and Satwa Park. The thing that's striking about them, and in, in contrast to most other cities in the world, is their fencing. Now, 
A lot of these places are fenced and a nominal fee charged for entry into parks, specifically to exclude the majority, uh, for obvious and understandable cultural reasons. Um, now, this has had the impact of excluding young, predominantly male populations of South Asians from conventional public open space. And we've, many, many of the speakers in Yasser has, has sort of uh, done a lot of research over the years on this and, and you know, Christiana's research has shown the way that this, this works. And in a, in a sense, it really underscores the disassociation that happens in the, in the urban areas. Um, so I started questioning then, what, what has this led to? What kind of nocturnal uh, personalities have we got in the Gulf? And I, I'm playing this up a little bit here. I'm basically trying to create a bit of a caricature here because the, these were uh, categories that kind of occurred to me. And the first, which I call the pay-to-play city, is these sort of public spaces, which are vibrant and quite interesting and comparable to many places in Europe and, and the US, but you have to be buying something to be there. And places, uh, this is City Walk in Dubai. Uh, places like this see many, uh, many nationals, far greater proportion of nationals than is represented as a total population. Uh, it also sees a much higher proportion of Western expatriates because they're the people that have the disposable income to actually shop in a place like that. Now, you can see from the, the aerial image that it's very much designed in the sense of the way that um, Western cities, in a sense, use things like courtyards in, in, in European courtyards, the way that uh, frontages and shopping areas uh, are uh, defining the public realm. There's very little in the way of genuine open space here, but at the same time, there's nothing that compels you to, to pay to be there. But the reality is people who go there are only going there because they're spending money. Uh, another project by the same developer, Box Park, which was shown earlier, is very much the same. It's one of these pay-to-play spaces. You're either there shopping or eating. There's very few people there just strolling. Um, and again, from the same developer, the, the beach at JBR is again another retail complex uh, where it's primarily leisure and entertainment. And it's, you know, they're attractive places. Uh, in this case, uh, it's on the beach. It has, it, it departs a little bit from the fact that it's the same things as City Walk or Box Park, but it also has a, a genuinely public beach. And so it, it's starting to extend beyond the sort of retail and leisure landscape to a, to a genuine public open space as well. Um, the next category is sort of what I call the smokers' lounges, and people have sort of alluded to this before. But th this place, this sort of languid place where people dwell for, you know, hours smoking uh, shisha, hooker pipes, um, uh, and often in, in the case in many of the, the, the sort of higher end places in Dubai, also drinking. So it, it's, it's a leisure landscape, but it's predominantly outdoor. Uh, it's, and, and again, people have spoken about this earlier today, there's a wonderful element in terms of when you pass a, a, a shisha lounge of the smell of the place because it's fragrant sort of fruit fragrances, it's the hubbub of people talking, the sound of the pipes, it's a genuinely immersive environment. Um, and, you know, many of the people in Dubai, whether they are of, uh, of regional origin or not, partake in this because they enjoy it. Um, and, and places like the, the boulevard at downtown Dubai, this is actually a, a place called Meza House, uh, again, is, is a place that people go to dwell for several hours and to be seen. Um, it's, as a public space, relatively unremarkable. It's basically sitting on a boulevard in front of a, a, a sort of uh, a building that's designed to look as a traditional building, but is not. Um, and, you know, it is the, the sort of uh, environment where people see modernity in the background, but also it has an allure of Arabian exoticism. And so a lot of tourists will partake in this sort of activity as well. Um, 
And others have sort of spoken about the way that, that people, multiple people, and I, in this case I'm sort of using an image of nationals, but it's not just nationals, it's, it's almost all social groups, will just pick up a, uh, and, and locate themselves on a patch of sand on a beach, on a dune by the side of the road, uh, and really sort of again have this sort of languid experience of the landscape. And it's about nocturnalism. It's about being out when the sun is down, and when you have the most comfortable time of day. Um, one of my favourite uh, things is what I call this, this Karakchai culture. And what you see often in association with mosques uh, and places of public gathering are these little tea shops. And uh, there's, there's one in particular I enjoy going to in uh, Jumeirah Beach Road. And you just... I typically sit at the, the restaurant next door and you see, um, I'll create a bit of a caricature sort of, of, of this, that you'll see the four ladies in a black Range Rover, uh, Emirati ladies pull up, honk the horn, uh, gesture out the window and a South Asian man with four cups of tea appears and they'll sit there for a while and then someone will, someone, a group of guys in a car will come up and do the same thing and try and chat with them as well. It's a, it's a really interesting social experience but it's not, a, it's not a public open space in the traditional sense of the word. Um, and and it's, it is a service landscape but it, it is really, for me, a very characterful part of the, the landscape of Dubai. Um, and, and there is a culture beyond the tea shops, even to sort of cafes and food, of literally pulling up, honking the horn, and expecting that someone will come out and sort of take your order. Uh, many, of the, many of our speakers, both yesterday and today, have talked about the, uh, the South Asian population. And, and it's very clear that they are the most underserved population. But because they are the most underserved, they've been the most creative about their use of public open space. And Cristiano's uh, presentation was quite, you know, uh, quite directly addressing this, this kind of thing. But it's beyond that. Uh, we haven't really spoken uh, uh, about uh, places like Karama. Uh, I think Yasser's research does uh, touch on very similar environments. But these are everyday lived places where um, people who live above the shops below are down in the street. These are the most vibrant and bustling places in the city. Uh, and they're interesting simply because of the vast volume of people, the colours, the sounds, the, the congestion. Uh, and that's not no normally something that we associate. Every Gulf city that I've been to so far has these, in these environments as well. So it's, it's not restricted to uh, one city or another. It's pretty much across the board. Um, and so when we look at uh, older areas like Dubai Creek, um, uh, either side of it, you have these kinds of environments where there is really vibrant, bustling places. Um, the, the creek itself, to me, is part of that scenario. Uh, and any of you that have uh, been to Dubai may have, may have taken an ABRA across a creek, which is quite an accessible form of transport. It costs to around about 30 cents to take a ride across the creek. Um, this, to me, uh, connects the two busiest, most interesting parts of the city across the origin point of the city, which is the creek. And again, many of the cities that you will have seen talked about have their origin point in a source of water. Um, so I think that these, these kinds of uh, environments have kind of been abandoned, in a sense, by the more modern developments, but they're the, some of the most interesting places. Um, this scene, uh, which is actually in, in Doha, in Qatar, uh, you've seen played out, in, 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 and a few people have spoken about this, but whether it's here or Diafa Street in Dubai, you'll see these groups of men sitting around just simply enjoying a patch of grass, even if it's in the middle or if it's on a traffic island. Uh, I've even seen groups like this, and for any of you that know Alain reasonably well, Alain is pretty much... Uh, identified by a series of roundabouts that have thematic elements like coffee pots on them. I've seen uh, entire roundabouts covered with people, uh, South Asian men just sitting on a roundabout on a three lanes of traffic going around them. I can't imagine being there myself. It doesn't seem like a pleasant space, but it's very common. Um, 
again, many, many people have spoken about this idea of, of uh, activity. Anywhere there is an open space, given an amount of time and wait for an evening, you'll see, it, you'll see a, a group of typically South Asian men turn up to play cricket. Um, and that can be at a labour camp, as it happens downstairs from my apartment, uh, a car park uh, or a beach. Um, as someone who's, uh, I'm originally from Australia and cricket is, is a form of religion in Australia, so I don't mind watching this, it's quite entertaining. Um, but there's another layer that, that no one's really talked about today and th this relates to what a lot of people think about when they think about Dubai. Um, and that's this sort of DJ culture, this lounge and, and entertainment place. And to me, again, this is a, is a part, is a component part of the landscape of the city. Uh, it, it can be uh, often at ground level. You'll find open air parties uh, with a DJ performing. It can be on a terrace. Uh, but these are places that are engaged with the cityscape. And you have, we have to, in my view, we have to treat them as part of the cityscape. Um, and, you know, this, uh, this is a Nasimi beach in, in Dubai, which is, uh, again, it's sort of uh, it's some, uh, some sort of hybrid where you're sitting on a really quite attractive beach, but you're in a lounge with a DJ and drinks, and this is part of what the broader population beyond the design community actually understand Dubai to be. And uh, I was really worried about this next category before I came to this event. But then when Pascal gave his presentation yesterday, I was like, oh, OK, all fine. No, no controversy there. Um, this was, incidentally, one of the things that my wife first said when I said, what do you think about nocturnal landscapes in the Gulf? Oh, the sex on the beach uh, dramas. What she was talking about were uh, a series of events that have, that have happened where either drunk tourists... Uh, drunk residents, or some combination of the above, um, have had public relations in public places. In this particular case, these two people were pretty drunk, had been all day at a, at a brunch, which is also a, a form of religion in Dubai. Um, and being inebriated, they ignored the, uh, the, the Emirati ladies that were sitting a few paces away from them and proceeded to undress on a beach. They were warned a couple of times. The police came and warned them a couple of times. They stupidly didn't stop and they were arrested and jailed. Uh, it's happened more than once. But uh, that's the most sensational case of it. The reality is that actually this culture of going to a brunch, drinking all day and then partying at night ends up spilling over to beaches. Uh, and so, again, I would count this as part of the, the landscape of the city. It happens far too regularly to be ignored. Um, and this sort of lewdness, this kind of uh, existence of a subculture um, extends also way beyond the, the, the examples I've shown. There are uh, places and uh, there, there are um, people... Um, that serve the, the other classes of society in the, in the region as well in terms of the oldest trade in the book. So these were this sort of catalogue of spaces. And, and again, as a landscape architect, I often come back to climate change because I think of landscape as a temporal or an ephemeral thing where um, we, we have to actually understand that things will change. A lot of people have talked about temperature. A recent uh, report was that pretty soon uh, the Gulf, the entire Gulf, will be too hot to inhabit by humans. And there's, there was an analysis accompanying that that sort of basically said that at a certain point the average temperature will, will exceed 55 and a half degrees and humans simply won't be able to live there. And I'm, I was very intrigued by that idea because... You know, what does that mean for the night? Uh, what does that mean for the cities in particular? But there's a, there's a, a really fascinating contraven uh, contravening sort of element here, and that's the, the studies that have been done mainly by researchers at uh, Mazda Institute uh, in the UAE that have shown that actually there's a reverse heat island effect happening in Gulf cities. So in Gulf cities, in 
uh, in complete opposition to the rest of the world, cities are cooler than the surrounding environment. In the case of uh, Doha and Dubai, significantly cooler. Why does that happen? I was intrigued by that. I, was, uh, I didn't imagine that it would, there would be so simple a solution to why this is happening. Um, but what you see here is basically uh, land coverage and vegetation coverage maps between 2000 and 2008. Now, it takes a bit of looking into this, but what you end up seeing is there's significantly more vegetation in 2008 and there's significantly less hotspots. So the research is basically concluding that in areas like Doha, it's five to six degrees cooler in the city than in the surrounding areas. In Dubai, it's up to 10 degrees cooler than surrounding areas. Um, and these researchers have attributed that to vegetation. So in broad terms, the people building cities in the Gulf have geoengineered entire cities in a way that could, uh, could actually show that these places will be uh, the, the, the places that can be inhabited in the region. Cities, in contrast to the rest of the region, may be the only places that are inhabitable. Or perhaps our future is to, to actually engage with the ecology, desert ecology, and geoengineer that to make these places livable. We have caused climate change. We have to respond to it. Um, so I, I, my, the way I want to kind of conclude this is look at the, these series of hybrid spaces. And I'm going to end up shuffling through them pretty quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, but these are spaces that have, be, have sort of evolved as more inclusive, uh, less prescribed in terms of their, their more democratic types of spaces. Um, they're not really remarkable examples, but um, I'll, I'll go through them in, in very quick sort of order. This is the Dubai Creek Canal, which was a continuation uh, of a water system. Um, what's interesting about it is that the, the, the promenades either side have been built uh, and they, uh, they connect uh, what was Business Bay before and the, and the, the ocean. Um, the, the spaces that I'm talking about are actually lining these areas. Uh, and I live just nearby. I live down here. And so I go there regularly. And what surprised me is the way that people have started inhabiting that space. Now, it's not complete. None of the development you see on this master plan is really there. There's no real engagement with the park yet. And yet, um, oh, sorry. I sh Let me just go back once more. So this is just a time-lapse video showing the sort of activity when nothing is actually addressing this canal yet. These are, and even this video doesn't really quite capture how busy this place is. Uh, there's no, people have no reason to be there. There is nothing um, that is there for people to buy or people to do. But it is a hybrid space that people are inhabiting and it's people of all social classes. It is labourers. It is Filipino shop workers. It is people like myself. It is Emiratis. There's an Emirati neighbourhood uh, that adjoins this. So it has become a place where lots of these people are mixing. And Abu Dhabi Corniche is a little bit similar. Because it's truly open and inclusive, uh, all types are there. Um, and that includes uh, as an event landscape. Um, this is, uh, there's been a series of pop-up or, or, or new urban sort of typologies um, that are, you know, inhabiting things like a car park. And this is the car park below my, my apartment, uh, which had a street nights festival. Um, what I found interesting was both that it was types of urbanism and, and public, uh, public art, street art, that I hadn't seen before. But even though it was a paid for, uh, in the sense that you, there was places to buy food, uh, it was largely free for anyone to go there. And so lots of people did go there, uh, of all social classes again, because there was free performances. Um, the Dubai Design District is another place that's quite similar. Um, and I'm going to sort of skim through this because I'm running out of time. But it, it's a place that has become very active 
as a nocturnal space. It's a place that I was involved in the, the, the master plan for the project. Um, I'm going to skip through it because I want to get through some of the others. Sukwa Kif was talked about the other day, so again, I'm going to skip through this uh, and not talk about it at length, but it's a space that works as an inclusive space, partly because it functions for everyday daily needs, partly because you don't have to pay to be there, but also because there's places that appeal to everyone there. Um, the last couple of... Uh, I hadn't planned to show these next few slides originally, but um, there was a series of comments made both yesterday and today that, that encouraged me maybe I should. And this is just a few projects that we've been working on or are working on at the moment that show how things are changing and I think the, that reflect the trajectory of what is happening. Um, uh, one project, which was actually an academic project that I, I worked on with the University of Western Australia, responded to this provocation that was several years ago, obviously, of trying to provide more open space in Dubai than anywhere in the world as a percentage uh, for per inhabitant, which seemed gratuitous at the time. Uh, and what we did was sort of look at it and say, well, this, this sort of idea of what Julian Bollard has called Pariscape, these giant areas of green, lush parks, is not the appropriate way to go. And really what happened was looking at something that people had talked about where all of these satellite projects had been developed but the space in between had been forgotten. And so this was an attempt to address the spaces in between with landscape. And I can see this and its relationship to the climate change scenario as being a very sensible and viable solution. Um, uh, in another very commercial example, this is the Dubai Mall here, and I promise it won't be much, uh, much longer. This is the address hotel here. Um, this, is a, this is pretty much just a vehicular approach for the mall. Um, this was sort of re retail planners of the mall were asking us to look at a public open space in this area. And this was intended to be a public open space that was free and open to all, where they had actually specified, we may show cricket matches there. Um, and it was in, in an idea about creating uh, a, a public space that was open and inclusive as part of an extension of the retail environment and to turn them all inside out, which I think is revolutionary in the region. I, I'm, I'm heartened to see people thinking about turning the, the mall inside out. Uh, another project which we're working on now um, had a very strong focus on the nocturnal, but most importantly for me was the master plan, its primary move of creating, f uh, sorry, creating free public open spaces without fences, without charging anyone, highly actively programmed for all members of society, um, served by public transport so anyone could get to them. Um, these, these, were, these are places where we're starting to see the kinds of things that we would like to see. Now, they're obviously probably a few years away from being realised, but this other project was a, a similar example where we put a park at the heart of the project because we wanted there to be sort of free and, and active uh, association movement through the project rather than it being a destination. Um, and so... This, a strong part of this was, was a response to climate and engineering very cool environments where in sunken courtyards and using sustainable design methods, reusing air conditioning condensate, we could create passively cooled spaces. So with that, I'll draw it to a close. Thank you and I apologise for going a bit over time. Thanks, Stephen. Now we'll have Hamed Hal. Uh, sorry, no. Um, let me see. Abdulatif, <laughs> yeah, Mishrat. Thank you so much. With Um I forgot that I have my glasses here. I'm losing my sight. Mundain Marahats. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Gary and William, for the invitation. Uh, Mohsin and Anita for hosting, and uh, Liz for making this possible. Um, what I'm going to be discussing today is um, an, going, an ongoing investigation that we've got um, in the office um, in Kuwait. It sits at a juncture of what I'm personally involved with, which is looking at the past as to 
what brought us here to the status quo, um, looking to the future, planning um, Kuwait 2040, either with Perkins and Will, or uh, drawing up the vision of Kuwait 2035 that includes Harir City and others. So this, this proposal kind of sits at the juncture of creating the present, which, or the new present, as, as we call it, as the new generations of architects in Kuwait uh, try to do. So what um, I would like to, to start with is a way of kind of organizing our thinking in how we perceive uh, public and private spaces, and then move on at the end to a proposal that we have uh, of a project. I would also like to thank everyone who presented before, because I think they've really placed a good base of understanding of uh, the context of the Arabian Peninsula. They've showed us how we are kind of the same, but at the same time, how we are different from one country to the other. Um, and yeah, so as much as I think Farah and Pascal and Yasser have described theories of, of, about what public space is and what structures that, I think uh, public space, specifically in, in, in Kuwait in the past uh, 100 years, is um, understood through the institutionalization process of planning in the country, which starts about in the early 1920s. Uh, we've just celebrated um, a few weeks back uh, 65 years of uh, urban planning in the country um, and economic planning too, which is kind of a, a juncture in between the two. Um, and the reason why I would like to, uh, to talk about this is um, throughout um, the history of Kuwait and even uh, the Gulf, the definition of public space um, is more political in how the rulers and the ruled think of what public is. Um, and this is where I would like to introduce the first um, lens. As we say, there are three lenses. The first lens would be uh, the, the transaction uh, in between ruler uh, and the ruled. The transaction is usually a political transaction um, that results in the understanding of the current political and economic climate. The main transaction of Kuwait that tra transformed um, the development of the country came in in 1962 when the constitution was signed. This is a very specific and important moment in the history of Kuwait where land and resources were nationalized. So um, I think a lot of people were thinking, who does, um, I think uh, it was Cristiano thinking of um, all, all spaces are public. And in Kuwait, it's very much so. All spaces are owned by everyone through the constitution. And this, this is what kind of makes it a bit difficult to leave the status um, quo. And as I'm going to show later on, we're kind of forced to do so because of the current economic uh, climates. So this is Sheikh uh, Abdullah Salim signing the constitution in 1962. The other notion that um, I would like to speak about is uh, patron. Through the constitution, uh, two things were created, um, a, f a somehow democratic state and a welfare state that's responsible for the well-being of everyone. So our parliament became the patron um, responsible for um, the livelihood of the populations. What, of course, the parliament did in terms of uh, legislations is create the governance or the administrative um, st organizational structure of the country. I find myself in the past few years designing more and talking more about these type of structures and how they would hinder development um, a little bit maybe more than um, what I would do in terms of um, design, uh, what we learned at the GSD. Um, in terms of Kuwait, understanding each ministry and the process of uh, flow process in between each and what it does um, is the key to opening different um, possibilities when it comes to designing space. The third topic is the rituals. So when we understand planning in the country, or what we'd like to um, design for is usually by understanding the rituals. In 1952, when the first master plan of the country was done by Minapri and Spensley, the new rituals of the city were the car, health, and education. So they wanted to instill these new rituals in the making of the modern-day modern Kuwaiti. And I think we still to this day owe 
our development to these new rituals. However, um, because of the stagnancy in, in Kuwait compared to other countries, such as Dubai or Qatar, Abu Dhabi as another emirate in uh, the UAE, um, Kuwait has seen a rise in uh, bottom-up movements um, that are ushering new rituals of how the city should be used, either through encroachment or through appropriation of uh, spaces. Um, right here, I've got a couple of images of um, our project, which is the Arabana Warehouse. It was one of the projects of uh, the Arabana project, the, the warehouse itself, which unfortunately uh, has closed um, because we couldn't find the right license. However, for the few years that we operated it, we operated it only at night uh, because that was the time when the authorities could not come and shut us down. So most of our events were uh, during the night. They were galleries, um, movie screenings, and basically we gave it out to any um, NGO or, or, or a cause that basically did not benefit from it uh, monetary. So we've lost the battle in terms of Arabana, but hopefully we did not lose the, the war, as they would say. Um, the other thing is Shaheed Park. And we've discussed Shaheed Park a lot, and we've criticized it, I think, a, a bit because um, of its nature, um, that it's a gated park. Um, and I think these three lenses of rituals, uh, patronage or patron, and transaction uh, are important in understanding the quality of that space. In terms of a transaction, for the first time, for design of a public space in Kuwait, different entities came together on the same platform. If you would remember the previous administrative uh, organizational chart, it created silos in between different entities which were reflected back into the urban grid. So basically, each entity was responsible for a small fraction of urban development, and it basically did not engage or talk to the other entities. So for the first time, we have a park that has museums, it has restaurants, it has um, different activities that occur within that. So in my point of view, the transaction here was successful. In terms of a patron, of course, the patron of this project is the Amiri Diwan. And there are certain protocols that you would act in uh, such a space. Um, however, that does not detract from it when it comes to understanding the rituals or the operators of the park itself, which is an NGO, uh, LOYAK. So it brought in, in my perspective, a new voice to Kuwait. Maybe not, I think we've been focusing a lot about um, uh, expats in, in Gulf cities. Here I, I focus um, specifically on areas that uh, take up the majority of our spaces, which are the residential areas. Um, and their occupants, which are the minority, the 35%. And I think for the 35%, this is a change um, of lifestyle. And it's a different voice that comes in through our um, uh, public spaces. So basically, we um, define transaction as the creation of an opportunity through the mutual agreement between parties, uh, assuring both public and private private benefits, the ritual as customary or um, burgeoning practices that affect behavior, and patron as a supporter, sponsor, advocate, or even a beneficiary of a specific endeavor or a cause. And I think um, these three together um, create an, a lens through which we can understand how spaces are placed together in Kuwait and how we can induce maybe change to see these type of newness. Um, of course, this type of research is um, coming at a juncture where the politics and the economics of the region are changing from those of uh, purely uh, welfare into more uh, capitalist systems. And the development of cities are seen as modes of changing the organizational structures of countries. So cities are seen as places of opportunity, economic diversification, jobs, and the other. This, is, this basically takes us to this image, which uh, for me and for everyone working with us, we're a firm um, operating in between Kuwait and Portugal. So a lot of our actually colleagues are from Portugal. And when they come in, they just have a different eye on how things um, are seen. So basically, you'd see a huge development, which is the densification of these urban neighborhoods, which I'm going to talk about later. later. And then the appropriation of public space. 
So it's an incision in the public space that would allow it to function where otherwise it wouldn't. And I would like to point out here uh, the presentation of Nasr and Joaquin in their um, argument that private space are the public spaces. And to uh, a large degree, that's very true. So when I see that, it's almost a seeping out of the private public into the private sphere, allowing the space to work in a quasi-public. And I think sometimes when we talk about um, design and um, um, what's good and what's bad, we talk about absolutes. And I think it's important to think um, of cities in transitioning. So I think Kuwait is a city that's transitioning. And you'd see a lot of these um, interesting things that uh, happen in the public realm. So basically here, the patron has changed. So instead of the public authority for agriculture and fisheries, it's X person who now um, basically occupies and takes care. So it's more of a, a custody rather than owning the space. And I think this tra tradition comes from, um, I'm going to talk later about it, uh, the Duaniyas. But I just wanted to show these two images. Sorry. These two images. And why I'm interested in the previous is that our planning processes that's been stated since 1952 are extremely, extremely strict. Each entity is responsible for the delivery of a certain um, infrastructure that does not allow any space for spontaneity. Um, and thus, the encroachment on public lands through the idea of taking care of them becomes an interesting um, idea. However, they're not private. And I think this is a very specific thing to Kuwait and to what we call the Duaniyas. Uh, traditionally, the Duaniyas were the only portion of the courtyard house that had windows to the street. And it was a place that was very much open to the street. Um, as we became part of these new urban neighborhoods, you would see what we're mapping here is a Duaniya of a certain family and then all the houses that belong to that specific family. So the extension of that public-private sphere in creating a, a, a space that's taken care of, and it's a street that's public, yet it's not really public because of that notion of belonging to that space. One specific thing that I, I, I kept thinking about with this um, notion of Kuwaitis owning uh, the, the whole of the country, and very soon you come to realize that every Kuwaiti or Kuwaitis do own their lands, but there's a sense of lack of belonging to it. And the, the thing of appropriating certain spaces links you back to that grid. Uh, we don't have any taxes, so basically all the public infrastructure is paid for. I think in the West, um, part of what makes you a participant is that you know that you're part of the space by merely paying for it. And that is something that we don't have. Thinking of the tents, um, when Gary called and um, asked to ask for us to participate, we were undergoing um, a small research, which now is hopefully going to grow, about um, the tents and encroachment um, on the national scale. And it's basically camping season that Joaquin and Nasser also spoke about when they spoke about the chalet in the south of Kuwait. Um, these are the areas that are allowed for camping, and they're numbered. Our interest in camping is to understand the ritual, the transaction that allows them to happen, and the patronage, to whom do they belong. My interest in the camps is it's in opposition to the stagnant grid. So understanding the camps might give way of how looser urbanism could be introduced back into our neighborhoods. Um, just a thought and just to link the conversations, I think what Pascal spoke about in terms of istirahat in, in Saudi, these are like the extreme form of istirahat. Um, they're on their, they, we just ended the, the cycle of, um, of uh, camping just recently on the 1st of April. Um, and they're on the second cycle of regularization, meaning it's for the second year that you'd have to register uh, in order for you to camp. And that moment, I think, in time is, is extremely interesting because you're trying to um, create a system for something that 
didn't have a system prior to that. During the day, they blend in with the, with the neighborhood. Uh, the tents are all of the same material, um, almost. Um, I've just actually read the codes uh, of these camps that they just released um, this year. One very interesting thing to me was the scale of time. I think as architects, when we design spaces, we're always um, grappling with the issue of um, climate. So Kuwaitis would like to design their homes uh, for the 10 months, in, in their perspectives, that they couldn't occupy the outdoors. So by signaling that camping season starts in November and ends in April, we're acknowledging that you can occupy landscapes outdoors for six months, and people do go for these six months. So in my point of view, this acknowledgement is the start of difference. Of course, the areas are public, everyone could go through them, and as we take more of a nocturnal lens to it, the, the privacy is exacerbated a bit. So the, the night gives you the different degrees of how open and how closed, how approachable or how not these camps are. What interests us is that during camping season, you'd see a whole city being built through these neon lights that frame the camps. And the density and scale of them is uh, pretty huge. Uh, they go from the south of the country all the way to uh, the north, so from Saudi to Iraq. What we've actually seen through our documentation of this kind of reminds me in a different way of almost Burning Man, but in a Kuwaiti version, in how you'd see cars wrapped around with neon lights, uh, football fields, uh, gaming areas, and for almost a, a six months, which, is, which I think is, is a pretty long time, people are almost given a carte blanche to do whatever they want in designated areas. Things like the opportunity to sell, and I think this is part of the transaction. When we talk about public space, and the inactivity of public space is usually because people cannot have simple as a small drink or a small uh, event in that space because they cannot use it to uh, benefit from financially. So how these type of uh, situations can occur. And keep in mind that food trucks, uh, which a lot of people um, are, are doing currently in Kuwait, are not allowed yet. And currently, they're, they're, there is a law that's being drafted for them in order to, for them to participate in camping season. So it's interesting to see that the laws of new things are coming up just by looking at something that was happening as a as a yearly ritual. We mapped two camps, Camp 13 in the south, which is close to Bnader, which is one of the most uh, occupied um, areas in Kuwait uh, on the sea, so it's where the chalets, the beach houses are, and Camp 73, which is up in the north in, uh, in Jahra. We do understand that um, in terms of locations, they're different. One is closer to Wafra. The other, Wafra is a southern farming camp. The other one is on the way to Abdili, which is the northern farming camp. Um, they change according to their occupants. Uh, camp 73 um, is less dense. It's less populated. The camps are further away from each other. Camp 13, on the other hand, is the opposite. Um, Camp 13 is also more, uh, I would say, lavish in the way that they use lights to attract uh, people or guests. It's where um, a lot of families go. Um, this is actually um, what we call a Bedouin wedding tent structure uh, built for the duration of, of, of camping. This is Camp 73. What's also interesting is how the camps um, kind of find the spaces that are higher up. So they're continually uh, avoiding uh, rainwaters and the such. 
And I think uh, there's a lady in the audience who had a very interesting question yesterday about spontaneity and how the recurring of a certain thing might not make it spontaneous. And I think in the desert camp, because nature is a, a factor, the spontaneity keeps recurring. So the, the sands are shifting. Uh, the water or the precipitation or rainfall changes year by year. So your landscape changes and your response to that landscape changes every year. This is Camp uh, 73. It's the, the denser uh, camp in the south. And it's used a lot for um, mainly um, economic um, reasons, let's say. So they would make the camps and rent them out to uh, third parties, which could be a very lucrative business for half of uh, the year. The last few images we took were during the last two weeks of the camps. So you'd see um, a shortfall or the decreasing of the number of camps um, in landscapes. Um, this is Camp 13, uh, the one closer to uh, Bnader you'd see uh, bigger camps. The camps, you can, now with the, with the, the new way of kind of um, regularizing camps, you would take them in increments of 1,000 square meter if you were an individual, and in increments of one, two, three, four, or 5,000 if you are a corporation or a governmental um, entity. And it's interesting to see, even on Google, um, how the limits uh, would change year to year as the uh, sands would shift. Um, the roads are, are things that are placed by experts who go there yearly, so that if you're an, uh, a newcomer to the place, all you'd have to do is just go on the tracks and you'd go from one place uh, to the other. And this is one of the camps uh, being up higher on the on the hill. Things uh, related to the, the most things that are sold in the desert actually are ice and water bottles um, throughout um, the camps. And here we see drinks and water bottles. So in the night, the, the, the phenomena changes. It becomes from a place to visit, um, an open duania, to a more invite only, or by invite only, space. Um, so the night cuts the definitions. They become an archipelago of different components within the landscape. And the situation changes from almost um, a family-oriented space to more of an, um, kind of a different type of space. These are some of the larger camps, and we see they could, they could actually um, increase in size quite a bit. And the new laws even have the Kuwait Fire Brigade involved in licensing these camps. So they're quite, um, quite the infrastructure in the desert. It's not just um, any type of, um, of uh, building or a transient um, structure. And these are some of the uh, rental areas for recreation. This is the typical plan. It always revolves around the duania, which is a space that um, people um, congregate in. I think in terms of what Farah mentioned yesterday as a space of shared belonging, I think the desert and the resurrection of camps yearly kind of creates that for Kuwaitis. Um, not as much as the Issei Shrine is in terms of its deconstruction and construction every 20 years, but the construction of a tent either with friends or with your kids or with your parents uh, brings people uh, together and it actually transfers knowledge from one generation to the other. And it's one of the few instances where such activities occur uh, where people come together to shape an, a, a space. One very interesting um, thing about, about camps is how, and I, I, maybe that would be the, the thing to, thank you, thing to um, 
elaborate on some other time, but it actually destroys borders. So in camp season, what's interesting is people would drive not only on the Kuwaiti landscapes, but through Saudi landscapes. And you would see the diversity and evolution of one landscape to another. So if we're thinking as a GCC to, to speak, I think one of the common issues is uh, camp season. And these pictures are of uh, people who are residing in the south of Kuwait, and they would go on day trips to other areas. So I'll come back to, to the city and just in, wrap up in five minutes. Uh, what we spoke about is these areas right here, uh, which, are, which I call the, the peripheries. And they're a place to look at in order to start, um, or to, to start to think about how things could be different. Uh, the things that you'd see here are the suburban blocks. This is the first ring road. This is actually the old Shahid Park uh, before it was um, reconstructed. And beyond that is the new suburbs. Within that, it was the old Kuwait city. Um, and this is basically what governs um, these areas, which is the NCU, the Neighborhood Center Unit, which the planners placed in 1952. Uh, within that, the services were designated. So there is a clinic, there are schools, secondary schools, parks, co-ops, uh, and mosques um, in every neighborhood. So they construct this block. Um, in Kuwait, currently the plans are to replicate the density of Kuwait uh, two times. So whatever we've built since 1952 is going to get built in the next 10 to 15 years using the same principles. I think one of the most interesting things that David from Perkins did as an exercise as to how to rethink these cities, at least in terms of densities. These are the co-ops. This is um, the theater of uh, one of the neighborhoods and the mosque. The reason why I bring, in, bring up the mosque is that that is the design intervention that we have in one of the, the only private-led uh, cities in the south. Uh, mosques are at a density of 2.5 mosques uh, per square kilo, uh, kilometer. So as Yasser said, almost similar to, I think, the UAE of 500 meters uh, in approximity, uh, that you can walk to them. Of course, as Studio Bound mentioned, how they can signal time. Um, they're an important time factor that structure people's uh, daily lives. Most importantly, when we're talking about transactions, and this is something that I face every day, is this. This structure basically is of the minister, Ministry of Awqaf and Islamic Affairs, responsible for mosques. These are as much as a private endeavors as companies are. When the country is um, giving jobs to 95% of the people, this becomes the livelihood of how people uh, earn their living. And the more complex the structures, the more complex the ways that you could uh, change that. And basically, this is what this is now. So this is their new headquarters. Um, However, the future is different. For the first time, Kuwait is issuing bonds in order for it to raise capital to pay for its deficit, which is around 8 billion uh, KDs. So multiply that by um, 3.2. So our project is in the south. It's op opposite from um, uh, the tents. It's in this privately led development. We saw it as an opportunity to do something different because it basically is led by the private sector and does not follow the, the urban plan that the rest of the country does. Our um, job was to design um, a base for a mosque uh, that would be replicated for um, 30 times. And basically what we're doing is the following. It's a kit of parts instead of designing one mosque. And we would like to start from zero. Um, we looked at the mosque of Prophet Muhammad, Quba, the first mosque in Medina, and the early mosques in Kuwait, and their simplicity and the way that they're used as hybrid spaces, as Stephen mentioned. So with this notion of hybridity, we start organizing our mosques as simple open areas um, within the designated spaces. What's important for us was more the energy or the electricity coming to these bases um, more than the erection of those infrastructures. And basically, the orchestration of the design takes into consideration transaction, patrons, and rituals. 
and then designs the infrastructure that could allow these um, to function. And what we're trying to do is create a space where the community basically could shape it according to their needs. Uh, we looked into how we can uh, retain water because in this area uh, there aren't um, uh, rainwater gutters. Uh, the issue of using the Manara as an infrastructure rather than just for calling for prayers. And uh, to create a silhouette of an ongoing city that would give the illusion maybe of a virtual city. These would act almost as uh, lighthouses for uh, boats to maneuver through um, the waterways. Sorry, I have to go through this fast and thank you. Thank you. Latif, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Now, the last, we are a little bit late um, already. Um, I would like to welcome um, Hamed and Farid. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Gareth, Les, and the team, uh, and GSD, for inviting me today to share my ideas together. Uh, I hate to be the last one to present. <laughs> I know everybody is tired. Um, I'm tired too. I would like to be uh, uh, to explain as brief as possible. Um, Dubai uh, is not many Dubai officials and uh, leaders, clients are not uh, shy of being uh, uh, spectacle or describing it. Uh, uh, this might not be viewed uh, as a negative thing, but uh, as a positive uh, vehicle for uh, a competitive um, uh, market economy. And um, um, in many uh, RFPs that I, I, I receive as a practicing architect, um, uh, to, to design something uh, unique, iconic, usually you see it in the RFP that you receive as a kind of mandate. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting, this um, uh, reduction of uh, complexities um, and complex um, um, uh, thing to, uh, tasks to do, like designing a city, into a, a simple, reduced, uh, recognizable, identifiable, uh, market, mar to market it also. Um, I think this is a very uh, genius uh, Dubai invention. Um, yet what gave really fame for, uh, for Dubai and, uh, um, and maybe success in a way, uh, it's brought a lot of uh, also uh, uh, stress and, and uh, um, Dubai somehow doesn't really work uh, as a city uh, but as a kind of introverted uh, zones which, which the way that these uh, zones has been made is um, that every uh, client or developer uh, is in charge of uh, a piece of the city and is completely, shall we say, um, kept away from uh, the public or even authority or competitors till it's been uh, marketed and announced. So uh, it is actually a result of uh, trying as much as possible to keep information and to be, shall we say, concealed and, and not to share information. Uh, but unfortunately, it's resulted to um, uh, this fascinating, uh, uh, maybe fortunately also, this fascinating kind of uh, um, um, uh, master plan. Um, to correct that, many attempt um, uh, is, uh, is uh, really happening to glue the city again and make it flow as much as possible and try to connect uh, the city again, uh, public by public and also by vehicle, uh, by pedestrian and vehicle. And uh, again, uh, design has been used to, uh, uh, to uh, as again, to provide that solution. But unfortunately, um, what is really kind of uh, maybe designed uh, uh, very well technically. Um, I mean, the, the plants are really uh, beautiful, 
the pathway. Uh, um, it's um, carefully uh, set. Um, uh, I, I think it's it's a beautiful uh, image, but it's not working because um, there are no uh, understanding of uh, either the environment or the context that uh, these designs has uh, to, to to serve. Again, um, uh, as you see here, um, uh, chairs are carefully placed toward the highway or toward the streets. Uh, pathways and green spaces are aligned. Uh, but what is really uh, common in this beautiful image is that they are spooky and there are no people in it. <laughs> Again, as, as beautiful as this, you imagine uh, when you are in a desert, uh, maybe oasis is kind of a place where you want to be in. But uh, uh, it's really, a, a, I think, a naive thought um, uh, to provide a, a green space, a, a beautiful space like that, not necessarily is the solution uh, uh, to connect and encourage pedestrian uh, movement in the city. Again, um, um, as you see in, in the um, reduction of that map to its only green spaces, it follows the uh, Dubai municipality ambition to make uh, Dubai green. Um, uh, and um, by that is uh, beautiful and working. Uh, but actually, um, it follows the logic of the uh, uh, districts and the plans and the master plans that is within. So it stays really. Uh, not connecting tissues, but segregated within certain uh, communities. Usually, this kind of uh, pocket of well or carefully designed kind of a landscape um, 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 introduced in the city to make it more uh, well uh, to encourage residents to interact inside that uh, piece of uh, land. Uh, and, and, and many many of the designers and, and professionals operating, especially in Dubai, is coming from uh, the Western uh, world. And their perception of what is uh, beautiful, what is beauty, uh, uh, recreation, free time, is completely different than uh, our understanding. And um, to have a picnic uh, and enjoy a certain landscape um, uh, um, it could the idea that this could be duplicated uh, in another culture, uh, and uh, only you have to keep the technicalities for the uh, grass not to dry or uh, the plant not to die, uh, and so on. Again, this is in Dubai. This is this is Mishraf Park in Murdif. Again, uh, a perception of what is a park also, what could be a park, define the park, and a place to really where kids can go over the bridge or also uh, be around the stream of water, but it's in the middle of the desert, has been on enforced almost from the uh, designers. Again, this obsession also of uh, controlling activities, um, fencing uh, is seeing as a way to keep certain uh, class away from these spaces, uh, controlling it. So you need to behave in a certain way. You need to be from a certain class, certain income, um, doing certain activities. Uh, within that uh, that zone, and 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 the whole idea of maybe fencing it is to whatever does not really fit the image that uh, the city want to uh, perceive for its residents, uh, it will be kept away from that spaces. Again, uh, surveillance, and uh, this is really a spooky saying al-udhna al 
which is the listening ear. So somebody is re really always listening and watching. And, uh, um, and in these spaces, you can't do, uh, you can't smoke, you can't uh, uh, do cycling or roller skating or uh, many, even bringing your pet uh, uh, simple uh, uh, picnic or barbecue is not allowed. So by these kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, rules and regulations, you are limiting really uh, the, the people who are using these spaces and, uh, and also limiting their behaviors and controlling their, uh, what they do in these spaces. Timing uh, is very restricted also. Um, I mean, I like the idea of bringing the, t the I mean, the cities are cooler than the, the desert in, in the Arabian. I mean, this is really the first time I hear this information. It's interesting, but uh, water is the biggest problem that we have in, 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 in the Arab world, or especially in the Gulf. We consume 15 liter per square meter daily. And this is the, the, the uh, shall we say, top uh, consumption per capita uh, in the whole world. Uh, and many of these uh, used uh, for irrigation and, and, and beautification. Again, uh, the image of Dubai is very important. I mean, when you, when you market yourself and you try to sell, you have to be uh, really careful of any unpleasant or unwanted uh, image that uh, um, uh, might come from the, the inhabitants, the, uh, the people who live there, the residents, the locals. So total control is very important in cities. And uh, it's a trade between freedom and uh, we give you um, uh, services. So if you want to really be in these zones, uh, enjoy your uh, beautiful house, uh, streets, and so on, uh, maybe it's a trade-off against uh, uh, freedom um, uh, and, and other things. Uh, what's, what's interesting uh, for me, the whole focus, um, the whole focus, uh, and, and this is the map of the UAE, uh, excluding the cities, or at least the major uh, cities. Um, and what we realize that uh, it's a huge um, uh, piece of desert, and where where the urban intensity is happening is really a small percentage of that total plain. Um, and the highways is used to connect between these uh, uh, centers, between Abu Dhabi and all the seven Emirates, um, uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, uh, a way to encourage economy, connectivity, and so and so forth. Um, and what uh, us as maybe maybe us as say a residents of Dubai or also a local of Dubai, uh, the, the way the way we used to uh, uh, perceive space, and uh, it's a, a bit more different than uh, maybe uh, uh, the West or even the East. I mean, uh, this is a wonderful kind of uh, space uh, sitting on the sand, which is very clean and cool and so forth. And here were uh, many of uh, early pic uh, pictures of leaders, for example, like Sheikh Zayed and uh, uh, Sheikh Rashid, or meet residents or plan for their future. They actually sit on that kind of um, um, uh, space and, and maybe even do sketches on the, uh, on the sand to plan the future. And uh, um, many early, uh, I mean, the Bedouins refused to shift to the cities, and they, they always uh, understood uh, their, their, uh, f the freedom of mobility. Uh, and uh, many houses actually um, uh, built in the early um, uh, 60s and, and 70s tried as much as possible to encourage the Bedouins to settle um, and to have a kind of a specific fixed Point. Uh, and many of the um, text written at that period of time was mentioning is very important to uh, have the Bedouins uh, settle down to create so-called so civil space or civilization. 
again, the opportunity to, this is Sheikh Zayed Road, um, the opportunity to connect to the, to the desert um, is a missed opportunity. Uh, I think now uh, the city is working like um, uh, ecology by itself, separated from the desert or separated from its natural surroundings. Uh, what I think is beautiful, uh, um, uh, these um, maybe unplanned uh, highways that cuts through the desert. Um, um, the car that is hated maybe in many, by many urbanists or by many people who uh, uh, like the city to be more pedestrian. The street light, which is a completely a simple uh, piece of uh, technology. Um, created a really interesting phenomena, which I'm coming to uh, explain now. Um, the, 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 I mean, the highway is a piece of infrastructure that is meant to be utility, uh, connecting function uh, A to function B. Uh, it's never meant to uh, be a space uh, or a place, uh, more accurately. Um, and this kind of un uh, unlovable, maybe, uh, a, a piece of uh, pathway. It's been used completely uh, as an opportunity in a different way um, uh, to, 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 to be access to that enormous and large space uh, uh, that consists uh, the UAE. And, and this, is, uh, this is a picture where you see this is not necessary camping. Um, uh, many people actually, uh, after the uh, sunset, they start to gather around the highway and start to really create their own spaces. And, and, and the car is becoming an important element where uh, people are starting to create their own um, uh, zone, uh, the way they like to, to, to make it happen. And uh, if I, I always say, if I want to meet my uh, many locals or Emiratis or do businesses, I will not go to shopping mall. I will not go to any place. I'll go to the desert. And actually, I make business not by playing golf, but by really going to the desert. And as you see, um, many, many uh, kind of uh, um, locals sit in this uh, wonderful organization and def defined by their cars for some kind of uh, privacy. And then uh, speaking of uh, culture, politics, and uh, business. Uh, this is a famous uh, singer called Abdullah Belkhair which you can find him almost everywhere in the desert, and he gets stuck often. <laughs> and they have to really come and rescue him. Um, but, but this is really a, a true, beautiful space, because you meet such a people that you don't have an opportunity to meet them maybe in a shopping mall or in other places. I mean, creating your own space is, is it's something that is. Technology is not, view, not necessarily viewed as a negative thing. Maybe, uh, I mean, you say, okay, if you can make a fire here, why you are making, I mean, uh, bringing lights? But people really enjoy uh, these technologies, and uh, they're not necessarily looking for uh, a kind of um, uh, polished quality, but this informal sitting uh, is more interesting for them, where they can make their own space and speak any subjects they want. I mean, uh, they are much smarter than us, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the people who sell products for us. And uh, Nissan understood this uh, association or love to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the car. And car is uh, uh, people, especially young people, uh, really uh, look at their car as a kind of extension of themselves. And uh, an enabler, it enables them to uh, to, to reach um, many places. Uh, so uh, the Nissan has introduced the desert camel power. Um, uh, the street light. Uh, it's really interesting that uh, many, many, many uh, people are choosing to stay close to the, to the road. Uh, and it's very convenient. The street light provide a kind of a hazy quality of light where families could really sit comfortably without being recognized from the people who are driving. So you see a lot of uh, gender mix uh, uh, in that kind of places. If you like 
a few meters away from uh, the road, you, if you can create your own space or actually be along that, uh, that space. Again, this simple phenomena sometimes becomes really uh, an interesting uh, um, um, uh, space, and you see people really along the street, they start to camp. Again, I, th I think I will uh, stop soon. <laughs> but uh, the further you go deeper to the desert, you have uh, different qualities of light and different settings, and even different group of people using these spaces. Uh, you are allowed to smoke shisha or uh, anything in the desert in a completely informal way. You are allowed to express your um, uh, insane qualities uh, and, and, and enjoy other people expressing that also. Um, being alone or also watching. I mean, people maybe they don't want to stay away from their TV. I mean, this is, but really sitting, uh, sitting and creating your own space and intervening and making a kind of a space that's suitable for you, this is a very interesting phenomenon. I mean, these guys are making their own movie. Maybe they cannot do it in the city because of regulation and you have to take approvals and so forth. Um, also, the, 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 the deeper you go uh, away from these, the, the, the linear spine, of, of the light, uh, the more even activities changes in behavior. And you see this uh, kind of a group of activities, different activities happening when you really come closer, uh, I mean, designed to maybe attract you while you are driving in the desert. Even simple petrol stations becomes an interesting meeting point um, uh, and a kind of a place to exchange and meet others. Uh, I mean, it will, it will be interesting. I mean, this is, I would see it as a beginning of maybe a research to maybe investigate how, how um, people are starting to freely occupying the landscape and creating their own comfort zone within that space and, 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 enjoy, uh, and how that is really shaping again the city uh, of Dubai. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's kind of 10 to 6, approximately, that's correct. So I would suggest to have just a very brief conversation and Gareth, no? Okay, so sh shall we just open for Q&A? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I will start with a question. I don't know if it's possible that our guests sit on their seats. Turn on the lights. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your um, for your presentations because they are so different in nature um, and in scope, and and in regulatory schemes. But I I think I, maybe I started with a question. Maybe it can leads to a new a new a new conference about really the role of the night. What is the role of the night? What is the role of a uh, electricity-less landscape, or even what is the role of the skyscape in design, or that could be? I, I think it's, uh, I think you're right. I think it's almost another, uh, another topic altogether. I don't know that, that we have to divorce artificial constructs from the, the landscape itself. I think we have to accept the reality of this interweaving of urbanism and, and landscape, and light is part of that. And I think that, that sometimes we rail against that, but we don't need to. Uh, I think what we can see in what we've talked about is the way that that can actually enrich the, the narrative about the cities of the Gulf. Uh, I don't think we need to sort of say, well, we just simply can't have this, or what would it be like if we didn't have this? It's simply... Um, Retrograde, and I think we need to look forward and, and, and embrace the ways that this can become new types of space. I may. Um, I think going forward, especially in the Gulf, with um, oil prices going down, the night provides an opportunity for things to continue. Yep. 
um, maybe with uh, less energy, um, smarter buildings, smarter landscapes, um, I'd see the night as uh, an opportunity for the future. I think in, in my own sense, I've lived in the Gulf for 10 years. Um, night for me represents the mo my favourite time of day um, in the sense that, that, that the sunsets and the quality of light that you get at the end of the day are spectacular. Yeah. I still am astounded by the quality of light at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And that sense of relief in the hotter months, which is not all of the year, we all mm -hmm. focus on that, but mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -hmm. um, that relief that comes at night, uh, be it perceived or real, mm -hmm. makes it, for me, the most important time of day. I, I, I think I'm guessing... I'm asking also this question because as designers, we have you know, role to innovation and acknowledgement and awareness, so on and so forth. And we know that many of innovations, particularly in mapping, if you think about celestial maps, they're mostly done in this region because of the qualities of the sky. So, so the qualities of the sky kind of triggered and forged a very particular way of, of seeing and sensing the environment that led to innovation of representation. So I'm wondering if these particularities, not only of the social aspects, which I, I I've, was amazing, the kind of the portrait and the, uh, the variances of that uh, was contained in, in your lectures, but also what are the qualities of the environment that we are talking about, what is the particularities in which design can actually start to dialogue and leverage upon? I mean, <clears throat> knowing the environment in the, in the Gulf in general, I mean, as in uh, being a place that's very extreme environment, being very hot, mm -hmm. very humid and so forth, uh, definitely night is a time that uh, is almost throughout the year, I would say most of the time that you have it's more comfortable for people. Uh, to come out, and that's where I would say there is, um, or there has been when you see in small interventions, it becomes a more, in a way, as a public space, it works much better. Um, so somehow you see, like, over designing the light, that over electrifying the space, uh, or over controlling in a way, has a negative impact right. on, in a way, creating that, that space that could bring people together. Uh, and I think, and that was shown, if you see, I mean, always the the age of infrastructure within the city that are quite very well lit and very well designed, I would say, it's in a way it failed in a way to uh, to uh, to function, uh, but in a way a very subtle lighting in the desert where people could in a way could interact with it in a much more smarter way yeah. uh, that adapts to their culture. So people could be sitting in a desert in a specific way that their privacy is being preserved. Mm -hmm. um, kind of, they're not being, on a, in a way, they have a view, a very glimpse view of what's happening, of the activities, but at the same time, they know that they're not being seen really from the people that are around them, which I think is quite very interesting, um, uh, uh, interesting f f uh, f f phenomenon by itself. Uh, <clears throat> I, think, I, I think the challenge of not really over-designing the, um, the light, but rather than uh, letting it to uh, uh, to work with the culture and work work with right. the environment right. in a way to uh, uh, to allow the public yeah. activity to happen with it. Yeah. I think, in a way, um, we suffer in this question of designing from assuming, and this is an old narrative, that it's tabula rasa, that that there is nothing there. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons that I tried to bring a focus back to ecology is that there is something there. And we have scraped it away and started again and imported mm -hmm. something. And in a way, we're starting to now, uh, through the work of, of these guys, you're starting to see yeah. how people are re-embracing the, that there is something of value there. Mm -hmm. Almost as designers, the old maxim, just don't screw it up. Don't design. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> one thing I would like to add here, I mean, in gen I mean, the architect or city planner as a profession is quite a very new profession to this region. Almost 40, 50 years ago, there were no architects. So there were builders that had, over time, developed the technique of building and how to deal with the uh, light, with shade and shadow and, and, and so on. Uh, but because of the speed of the development, I think almost all that knowledge, in a way, was in a way disappeared. Yeah. And the architects came and they started, in a way, from scratch. Um, but the way I would see it, I think the way, the same way that the development has been progressive, um, the learning from the mistake is becoming progressive. 
And in a way, you're seeing that intervention that's happening that in a way to bring back uh, the real values of the public space within the city. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Oh, oh, Maybe I just open for two questions, Max and... Um, I actually had a couple of comments. I'd love if I'll share mine with you afterwards, so because I know we're in a rush. But I wanted to to, to uh, mention just um, to Stephen, you know, the premise you mentioned at the right off the bat of your talk was about you know the multiple identities or multiple personalities of the Gulf City, um, and I think there's a little bit of a risk of overemphasizing. Um, you know, what many of us who have been writing at least more in the social sciences over the past 10 years or so of Gulf cities, uh, in the words of Nalida Fukaro, who's written on Bahrain, to dispel the myth of the exceptionalism of Gulf cities. And I think Ahmed, myself, Pascal, we've all been sort of writing about that to show that the, these cities are not exceptional. There are unique elements and aspects, but I think there's been so much of a tendency to look at these as ex entirely exceptional cities that bear no comparison to cities anywhere else in the world. They are just exclusive unto themselves. But when you talk about the multiple personalities and identities of the Gulf City, what city in the world does it, it, it you know, is not, um, it does not contain, let's say, these multiplicity of identities. That's in some ways, by definition, what makes a city is the presence of diversity. I think there is a tendency to overemphasize some of these very sort of um, sexy just juxtapositions in the Gulf, you know, the girl in the bikini and the woman in the niqab. And, and, and I mean, we see it in the landscape too, putting the old walls with the modern skyscrapers in the background. But for the Gulf, I mean, this has always historically been a hybrid city. It's nothing new. Scale has changed for sure, and there's some unique aspects. But if you go back historically, Dubai 200 years ago was always a hybrid, a city of hybrid multiple identities and personalities. Um, and so, and again, I think that's something that you can see, even those dramatic juxtapositions of people you can see in any city in the world. But I think that there has been this, this emphasis on exceptionalizing these cities because of the unique elements that certainly do exist. But I just wanted to, to bring that up because I think it's, it's something that's important to always be conscious of in these cities, that they're not exceptional. They're unique, but there are global processes at work everywhere. Uh, I would generally agree, but I don't agree. Um, I think the cities of the Gulf are exceptional in a, a very particular way, in that the natives of the, the place are in the vast minority. And I've never come across another place... Well, not in Saudi, correct. Uh, and I'm... I'm Yeah, it's not the only place that, that has a multiplicity of identities. Yeah, look, I, I, think, I, I think I was, I was trying to say that I don't see this as a disorder. I didn't want to create that impression. But what, what was important to me was that we see the, these cities, like we see in ecology, multiple overlapping identities and organisms. So I'm, I'm using things that people can refer to. Does any city in the world different from that? Uh, in fundamental terms, no. <laughs> but what we've done in the past, I think, is focus on a specific element. And we pick out a group, uh, a thing, a place, and I, I don't think that we, as, as people who intervene in the urban fabric, can continue to do that. All I'm trying to do is say, in a, in a lot of ways, yes, there is multiple uh, things happening. There's multiple things happening in many places. But we can't ignore the totality and focus on the singular. Because when we do, we screw things up. Everywhere, probably. <laughs> so uh, I would like to open to another question. Yep. Thanks. I would just like to make one comment about temperature. I'm trying to imagine how hot it is. So there, people are welcoming the sun going down. Here, we're anticipating 
summer when the sun isn't going to go down so early. And if I were living in Finland, I would really be anticipating the summer. So I'm just, I'm, I, I think it's a wonderful conference. I really appreciate it. But I really think we need to also remember the heat. And many people have mentioned it, and certainly the schedule of people's daily lives mentioned, have made it very clear. But I started fantasizing about darkness, and I had to remember that in New York, we can't wait till it's brighter sun. Can I comment on that? I think um, as planners, and not only architects, you kind of have the tendency to control even uh, time, in, in a way, of when people do things. And I think specifically in, um, I mean, the ritual of prayers in Islam, one of the most important players, uh, prayers is the Fajr prayers, which I think half an hour before sunrise. So the moment of expecting the day is a very important moment in people's lives there. It's the few hours where uh, light is still soft and gentle, and people do wait for that. And actually, there's been a legislation in Kuwait parliament, in the past parliament, they're bringing it back now, and it's actually, it's almost like daylight saving, so it's to shift the day so that there will be um, a longer soft sun uh, for people to enjoy, um, so that they get back home before the, the hot sun comes about. So um, as, as planners, they're even thinking of changing people's daily lives through that by responding to when the sun comes up and when the sun comes down. I, I, I just want to make the point on this. There's two, two things I, I want to say. One, um, it's hot in the summer, but the way I sort of often relate it to people who've never been to the region is, you know, it, the difference between almost summer and the peak of summer is very hot versus very, very hot. It's not a big difference. Um, a, a lot of the problems are caused by thermal shock of going from a very cold indoor environment to a very hot outdoor environment. And actually, it's that in-between space that we need to create to, to modulate that. The second thing I want to say is it's not all the year. And even commercial developers that I've spoken to are hinting at that we're really only talking about two months of the year which are insanely hot. And if you look at a lot of cold regions, Boston, large parts of Canada, you're talking about a cold season where you will not go outside that extends for longer than that period as well. So it's not always the case. I love eight, nine months of the year in the, in the Gulf. It's sensational weather. Um, so uh, it's, you, it's not really a singular thing that you can talk about. It's ephemeral and it changes. And I enjoy the seasonality of it. Mm -hmm. Very good. So uh, we have to wrap up. I will just invite Anita and, and Mohsen to, to help us to finalize the, this event. Thank you again for your presence and contributions and for your critiques also. Um, Anita, Mohsen. Well, um, I know we're rushing. I, uh, I wanted to thank everyone. I've learned so much today. Uh, it's been very, very stimulating. Uh, Ahmed, I was just going to say that I, perhaps of all the things that we've seen over the last two days, I'd like to encourage you to never describe the desert as empty. That is the best design I have seen, a radical topography that casts shadow on itself. It seems like the city, in a way, is empty of meaningful light, and the desert was full of meaningful shadow. And uh, that was such a great way to, to end this conference and uh, more to come. Nelson. Well, well, Anita, thank you for um, supporting this. I just wanted to also take a minute to um, thank you all for coming. I know so many people have come a very uh, long distance and yes. um, and they've been thinking about this kind of interesting, important topic. I, of course, want to thank Gary and William, our colleagues at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Aga Khan program. Uh, you know, with the Aga Khan program, one of the things that's, that's exciting is that we are trying to open it up 
in many ways to sort of see the Arcon program as embracing a lot of the critical contemporary issues that we face and to make it uh, in a way much more plural uh, to include many, many, many more voices. Uh, and I am um, I'm really thankful to Gary for bringing this particular project on the on uh, nocturnal landscapes. Um, this is obviously a topic that a lot of you have talked about in terms of its relationship to public space, in terms of what it could be, in terms of its representation, all really fantastic things. It's also, for me personally, I think this is a topic that, um, you know, sometimes with certain things you start thinking about things very early on. And, um, and um, I never forget the experience of being on a plane when I was very young. And um, one of the things about being in this region is that there is a lot of darkness. And then when you come across some little part, little bit of urbanization, and you see the light that is appearing, it's very magical. Um, and you don't, you don't actually see the city in the way that we've seen in a lot of photographs, where it's kind of you can still recognize the city. Because what happens at night is that there is the darkness creates a level of opacity when the place disappears. And so what you see is a new kind of landscape in some ways through the light. And, and I think going back to what Sylvia was saying and the whole relationship to landscape, something that I've often wondered is why, why landscape architects don't actually, um, I mean, they design with trees and nature and they design with hard landscapes, but it's very rare that they design with light. Uh, I don't mean design a landscape and then light it. I mean actually design with light. And so that is a really um, important challenge um, of this particular conference. It's also, it came up in another conference that we had a couple of years ago on airport landscapes when I felt very strongly that, for example, the work of Michael Mann, the, 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 the director, he made a movie called Heat, where the last scene is a, is a, a kind of play between Al Pacino and Robert De Niro, and the landscape of LAX is lit by the planes. And that also creates a very specific kind of landscape. So I think this is a, this is a challenge, in a way, to us. It provides an opportunity to think about um, new possibilities, new, new kinds of situations where we can think about both our cities and landscapes through um, the, the, the lens of light. Tokyo is a perfect example of that kind of thing, where it's a very different city during the day than it is at nighttime because of the neon lights uh, in front of all the in front of all the buildings. So I think it, it just creates um, a lot of evocative kind of um, possibilities. Uh, last year. I was in Alexandria and I had to go to the airport at like four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning and uh, along the Corniche, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people who were actually sitting and drinking tea and coffee and whatever. It's clear that those people didn't get up and, uh, and go to have tea and coffee at 4 a.m. It's because they were there at nighttime and they stayed and they went through a kind of cycle of transformation from night today and actually experienced in a way how the Corniche, how the sea changes because I was also there the night when it was dark before I went to bed and while they stayed awake and you saw those thousands of people who were swimming um, and in the morning there were other people who were also swimming. So I think this, this in-between situation is also a wonderful thing. To, for us to be, as a school, to be more conscious of that is what is the difference between designing for the night and what is it like to be designing for the day. And I just want to thank all the, all the presenters for you know, pr opening up that kind of lens to us. And hopefully we will also go on and, and think about new forms of nocturnal landscapes. Anyway, thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Thank you.